hello, I'm uh, Carl Castleton. Um, oh, I hit my slides, I guess. Um, oops, I messed up, sorry. Um, today, uh, everything I express are, uh, the opinions I express are my own. I don't want it to be attributed to a particular place or institution I've worked previously. So uh, I know some lawyer would probably say I should put more words on it than that. <laughs> but, uh, but that's what I'll put on there for, for my slide. Um, if you're a good parent or you try to be a good parent, like most of us, you usually try and tr teach your kids how to have a heartfelt apology. And all heartfelt apologies have three parts. They have an acknowledgement. You have to actually say, I'm sorry for what happened. You have to have remorse and empathy. You have to show that you understood the impact of your mistake. Um, and you have to do something to, uh, for restitution. You have to do something to kind of restore what you damaged. Um, so if you're a good parent, these are the kind of things that you should do. If you care about something, this is something you should be willing to do. Now I want to talk about where we're at in technology today. Um, I pulled these numbers from a couple very large organizations. This one's Intel. This is the number of women, percentage of women employed in the tech positions at Intel. This is the number for Google. And I'm not picking out these two companies for any other reason than these are, these are the numbers, right, across the industry, right? They are where we are at in the industry today. Now, here's the most shocking thing to me. Um, people talk about changing the technology or changing the tech industry. This is the percentage of women in the U.S., we are doing such a bad job that even the majority population is not interested in those tech jobs. You know, we can consider other groups and target other groups, and we should, and I think you'll see some of my thoughts on that, I think, cover those, but we're not even a do, doing a good job with the majority of people in the United States. Now, I want to take you back, and I brought a very old machine here and go a little bit nostalgic so you can understand what my experience was and then see if what, what is the difference, what's changed, or did things not really change and we just never didn't pay attention. So this is a, this up machine up here, anybody? This is a Commodore VIC-20. Um, this, I saved up my money for the entire summer to buy one of these, and this is the cheapest machine you could buy. Um, people with Commodore 64s would laugh at you for having this machine. It has a whopping 4,000 bytes of RAM. Literally, your cell phone probably has a million times more memory than this. <laughs> That's the kind of machine I would save up money for. And it would come with manuals like this. This is the entire manual for it. Very thin. And it's actually arguably one of the most inviting, fun manuals. If you actually look at this manual, it's printed with cute icons and pictures. Something, I'm sure the typesetting of the day, remember this is 1980, that they probably hated the way this was made. It was a difficult thing to produce, I'm sure. But this came with it, and, and this program, this one up here that I put, um, will basically animate that little bird off to the side there, will flap its wings. That's what it does. And if you showed this in 1980s to parents, after you saved up your money to buy the machine, they will think you are Matthew Broderick from War Games. <laughs> they, will th they will like, this person is going to grow up to be an amazing programmer, computer person. And it's on page 53 of this tiny little book. And it, the, the teacher we had at the time, because technology was so new, the teacher um, it just went off for like a, a summer thing, you know, like, like teachers do today. They went off for like a one-week class on learning how computers worked and how to program. And what the, he came back and he basically said, you know, hey, I kind of understand what the machine does. Here's the manual for it. It happened to be a TRS-80. Um, I do still have one of those as well. So, so uh, it was a TRS-80, and it was basically his, his goal was, and they didn't call it that then, but his goal was like, well, here's the manual, here's the computer, just don't break it, it's expensive. You know what I mean? It was, it was like making a, a, a playground for working with this technology and exploring it. That was my experience. That's what we had. 
And so it was just like, it was a, you know, it was a, a free-for-all. We, we call that a flipped classroom today, right? But that was the idea. He didn't know much more about it, and I can tell you, you know, a middle school kid has a lot of spare time on their hands. They might learn a lot more about that machine than he did very quickly. But that was okay. No one thought that as a bad thing. If I told somebody I had this machine at my house, they didn't basically say, oh, that's a terrible machine. They're like, that's amazing. And when you showed them what you could do with it, they were amazed with that as well. That's the world I grew up in. That's what it was like. So this is what I want to say. I am sorry that right now, I don't think that's everybody's experience. We do not make the tech industry inviting to everybody. We put interesting, subtle barriers on people to feel uninvited to those areas. We, we are not, and I say, I say we, I should say I, I can only speak for myself. And I'm not talking about the very overt, clearly out of bounds, you know, let's talk to HR about the statement. You know what I mean? I am talking I am talking about much more subtle, you know, just not paying attention. You know, what I did wrong was apathy. You know, when I started to see my daughter um, go to middle school and I kind of was curious about what the computer classes were like and I had opinions about it, I'm sure she could tell you about them, um, but, but I, didn't, I didn't feel like I should go and try and change the way this school was doing, kind of trusted that that was the right way. But the st schools are doing things in a certain way for certain reasons. And again, I'm not accusing them of anything of maybe just not thinking about some of this stuff. That's my plan today, is to convince you to think about some things that maybe we haven't been thinking about. And so that everybody can have that kind of am amazing experience of being accepted, even writing simple little programs saying, that's amazing, right? That's a difficult thing to find today. So I, I am sorry that not everybody, if you sat in a classroom, I, I literally was talking about this conversation with another person, uh, a, a young woman who was in media, and, she, and I, said, she, I said, you know, I'm kind of giving this talk about this, and she was like, you know, I took a computer classroom, a computer science class, I sat in there, I just didn't feel like I belonged. That's contributing to that. We're not, we're not, we're doing something wrong. We clearly are. And I think I have some solutions. This, these mistakes over years, right, have now accumulated to the point where we have a million tech positions open in industry right now. And if you took all the graduates from all the U.S. universities, even the ones that I work at, right, you would only have 60,000 people ready to fill those positions. But we are probably marketing, if you want to think of it that way. We are probably getting a hold of the mind space of about half, you know, to a quarter of the people that could do those. That's what we're doing today. So, remorse and empathy. I, I have to say, what was interesting about it is, as I became aware, you know, you're first a, a new computer person, and you're just kind of learning it. I'm in middle school, and it's fun. You know what I mean? And then I, I got a job, you know, I went to college and I got a job and, and I was busy doing it. Then you're a young parent and you're so busy learning stuff that you never really think about like setting yourself up for success in the near future. So, you know, we're not asking about what the middle school tech class is like when your kid's in elementary school, right? And so when I see what, what, what the world was like from my daughter's perspective, I can see those subtle mistakes. And she had me for a dad. She had a super nerd for a dad, right? But trying to convince her, because the problem wasn't just with me. It wasn't in our house. It was kind of just a larger picture. What are the chances she's going to go out and see somebody and be told that, you know, subtly that she's not supposed to be there, right? And how does that occur? Again, it's not these bold statements. It's this subtle stuff. What's the subtle stuff that we're doing wrong? So restitution, we should do something to try and fix this. Uh, me coming here today, willing to uh, talk about this and try and explain what I think is part of that, 
I would say I have, I've probably been on a 10-year journey of understanding that I should have done more and trying to do better. But this today is meant to show you what I have learned, and I hope you can kind of see where, where some of this uh, will go. So here's the, my three-bullet checklist. And at the end of this presentation, if I hear resounding applause, which I hope I do, I hope, I hope it's a commitment personally to do these three things, and I'll explain them in a second, when you leave here today or when you next have an opportunity. That's what I'm looking for. So the first thing is check your apathy. If you're a tech person, like take a moment looking away from the computer terminal, the screen. Now they're LCD. We're not even shooting electrons at our face anymore. Do you see what I'm saying? Still take a look around and see if the, the demographics of the people you see in your work area match what you would see at the grocery store. If it doesn't, you should start asking questions about that. And I would not wait until you have a middle schooler and you're concerned about what she's going to go through. Doing it now is better. You have a newly minted bachelor's in computer science, right? Take a look up. If the room does not look like the society you live in, you should do something about that. You should stand up and start asking questions. Second, accept all skill levels at all times. Um, this is one of those that's very interesting to me. This is one of those subtle ways we basically don't uh, help people. If, if you have uh, somebody coming into a room and you are basically saying to them, well, you know, you don't really have the skills. Let me take over for you. SNL used to have a skit, right, where the guy would just take the keyboard away from people, right? We use the term noobs, right? That's a trigger word for me. It's like, kind of like, hey, wait, all of us, like somebody taught you to double click. Somebody taught you to pinch. Some of us are still trying to run our Google Home devices. Does that make sense? Everybody's learning something. We have to accept those skill sets. That means we have to accept maybe a computer science teacher who doesn't have a bachelor's in computer science teaching our kids. We have to be willing to let them flip the classroom. We have to let them be willing to make a safe place to play and let those kids experience that. You know, it's, it's expensive technology. Don't break it, that's what I'm saying, but please, you know, please learn this stuff. That's what we're trying to get to. And lastly, defend everyone's right to use and learn technology. Now, this one's interesting because it seems like, well, you know, Carl, I don't see how this is a problem, but, but think of it this way. We, we tend to, when we buy purchase it, when we buy machines for like an educational institution, we tend to buy the top of the line. Let's get a decent machine because we're going to need them for four, we're going to have them for four years, eight years or whatever. And so we might as well buy the top of the line. But the subtle change that happens when you start to say, guess what? So, you know, here a learner comes to you and says, hey, I want to do this work at home. It's like, well, sorry, the, the software package you've shown doesn't, doesn't run on your machine at home. You, you know, you're going to need a better machine at home to do that. You're going to need a machine at home at all, right? And it's going to have to be a top-of-the-line machine. Is that what's going on? Because, you know, we could send them home with a $20 Raspberry Pi and a USB keyboard and mouse and say, plug it into your television. Learn to program. Learn HTML. Learn JavaScript. But is that the message we're sending out? I can tell you right now that a Raspberry Pi has a lot more memory than this thing. I, can, I learned for loops and if-then statements, Turing equivalent languages for non-computer science people. Turing equivalence is the idea that if you write it in this language, you could write it in any other Turing equivalent language. This thing is Turing equivalent. You know what I mean? We can use some pretty low-end hardware and teach the skills we need to teach. We should do that. We should accept that people are learning on those machines. Lastly, or, or I guess that's my last point. So the, the, the point I would like to make is, here is a modern version of the Flappy Bird. This is written in JavaScript and HTML, all in runs in one web page. I would hope also that everybody in the room would now see that if some learner showed you this, that you'd be telling them things like, you know, maybe you're like Letitia Wright from Black Panther. Maybe you're going to be like that. And while I started the conversation saying these opinions were my own, I'm hoping 
that there are some people in this audience who agree with me. Thank you very much.